tonight, I would like to share a secret with you. I've kept this a secret for a very long time and I had good reasons for doing so, because this here is my childhood diary. I'm going to read to you from it. This happened on a very special date. Some of you may remember this date and this great event. I am from Germany, as you may probably hear. <laughs> so, and I'm going to read it uh, to you from the diary. Um, of course, I read it in the English translation for your ease of understanding and because I didn't know that much English at that time. I was a kid. The German Democratic is opening the wall. Two weeks ago, Hungary opened their borders. 200,000 people or so are already here, and I'm curious to see how many will still come. Finally, everything will be fine. That the border is open, this is so awesome. And for me, this was particularly awesome because just a few years ago, I had been to the German Democratic Republic to visit our relatives together with my family. And of course, as a kid, you do not really know about what it is like to live under a dictatorship. But what I felt as a kid was that the adults were afraid, that they were, were afraid of something which I couldn't really pinpoint down. But I think now I understand that they were afraid of speaking out. And so I was very happy when I saw all these pictures on the television afterwards with all these happy people who came over the border from the east and from the west, and who were welcomed on either side. I'll just put this down for a moment. Please remind me of it, because if any one of my students find this, I'll be totally <laughs> screwed. <laughs> so this was when I realized that freedom is cool. It was really cool, because it, uh, it was such a good experience when I noticed how much better it is if people can speak up and if they can speak their mind, if they don't need to be afraid. So what does this have to do with uh, the topic of my talk with science? Science is the institution of society whose noblest task it is to pursue truth. Of course, we can never attain truth. Uh, this is this old positivistic view that we can one day find truth or whatever. But nowadays, we know that we can only pursue it continually. We can, tr we can try with transparent methods to find out about the world as much as we can. And truth is something that dictatorships do seem to have a problem with. Because when you look at what dictatorships do once they're in office, they forbid everything that has to do with freedom. They forbid every institution that wants to speak out and tell the truth. They censor the press. They forbid arts. And they also try to attack science. And apparently, apparently this thing doesn't work. <laughs> no, it does. OK. Apparently, who fears truth fights freedom. Because they have a good reason to do so. Because once uh, truth is exposed, they're exposed as well with their lives. So you might think that we have learned something from the dictatorships of the 20th century, that we have learned something from the Nazi regime, that we have learned from the second dictatorship in Eastern Germany. But when you look at the news today, you notice that not much has changed. We have a president who accuses the press of spreading lies. In science, we have certain branches of science which are completely cut off, like the gender studies in Hungary. We have branches of science that lose their funding, like climate studies in the US, because they're no longer in line with what the government says. But there's more to this. We see that parties today are using the means of propaganda, that they're taking disparate facts and placing them next to each other as if they had something to do with each other, which is not the case. And they use this for their political purposes. It even goes so far that some consider reality to be a totally irrelevant criterion, as we have seen some time before. It's not lies, it's alternative facts. So what is the difference between facts and alternative facts? Facts are close to the truth. Alternative facts are lies and propaganda. This is where science comes into play. Because where science tries to understand the world as it really is, 
propaganda tries to spread an image of the world as they wish it were according to their ideology. Where science values evidence, propaganda de um, discounts this evidence. They prefer obedience over critical thinking. Where science tries to tackle the problems that affect all of us and they try to tackle them together, propaganda splits the world into an artificial us versus them. And where science values the complex questions of life, propaganda tries to find the simple answers. And it is clear that propaganda is much easier to understand than science. And maybe this is what makes it so appealing too. Science is complex. It is complex for scientists who are experts in the field. But it is even more complex for people who are not the experts, but who, um, are, who, de who, depend, on, who depend on science. Who of you has a smartphone? I guess it's most of you. So most of you likely don't know how it works in detail, but you trust the scientists who build and developed it that it won't burn in your pocket. And so we need to, we need to trust where we, cannot go, where we cannot fully understand the complexity. Oh, come on. <laughs> and so I think that trust is indispensable here. What is trust and what are the sources of trust? The German psychologist Rainer Bromme once developed a model which differentiates between three sources of trust, and I'm going to present it to you. So according to his model, trust first comes from expertise. We trust those people who know what they're doing, who have knowledge in the field. Second, we trust people who practice integrity, who work according to rules and standards, who work transparently. And finally, we trust those who are benevolent, who want to do something for society. These three aspects of trust were taken up in a recent survey on in how far people trust scientists. This is a representative survey, which is done every year, the so-called science barometer. And here you see the three dimensions and what people reply to them. So the reasons for trusting scientists are that they are experts in the field. There's no denying this, most people agree on this, so two-thirds of the respondents said that this is fine, scientists know what they're doing. The problem comes when we look at the integrity dimension and especially at the benevolence dimension. Because here we see that less than half of the respondents say that they trust scientists because they adhere to rules and standards or that their research is for the public benefit. Besides looking at the reasons for trusting scientists, it's also interesting to look at the reasons for not trusting scientists. And this is what they did as well. And what you see here is that the most important reason why people do not trust scientists is because they perceive them to depend on their funders. This is quite ironic because external funding is one of the criteria according to which science is evaluated. So it's totally worthwhile to, uh, to acquire funding. This does not mean that someone who acquires funding is a bad scientist necessarily. Of course not. We need the money. We have, we have precious and expensive machines. We want to make representative services which are expensive. So we need the money, but we must keep in mind that the external funding may be a source of distrust from the general public. So this is part of the incentive structure. Getting cash is worthwhile, and what else is? Two German psychologists, Andrea abele Brehm and Markus Bühner, conducted an empirical study, and they asked um, German psychology professors about the criteria which they apply when selecting some, some professor for a permanent position. What is more common is that people are on fixed-term contracts. Of the pre- and post-doctoral researchers, more than 90% in Germany are on fixed-term contracts. And the only chance to stay in academia, which we have to distinguish from science, keep this in mind, this will be a recurrent theme. So if you want to stay in academia, in the science system, your pretty much only chance is to obtain a professorship with a permanent contract. And so it is important to see what are the criteria that the commissions who decide on your fate apply and what they wish to be applied. And what Abele Brehm and, and Buna found out I will quote this to you because it's, they worded it so nicely themselves, I couldn't say it any better. 
When summarizing the is-ought discrepancies, the respondents believe that the number of publications, the number of peer-reviewed publications, this means publications that are evaluated by other expert scientists, so we have number of publications, number of peer-reviewed publications, and the amount of funding is rather given too much than too little attention, whereas the opposite is true for quality criteria. That's a statement, isn't it? So the question is, what is quality? What is good science? And to me, good science is the continuous striving for truth in order to understand the world. And this is not really what is rewarded in academia in the science system, because as we, as we have seen, funding and publications, especially the peer-reviewed publications, play a much greater role in there. And this has consequences. We, have, we don't have this overlap anymore. It would be the ideal world if science and academia completely overlapped, but we see that this is clearly not the case. The consequences are that there is fierce competition over these few positions which are not on fixed-term contracts. This also has resulted in a skyrocketing number of publications, because whatever you count, you get more of it. And what has also skyrocketed is the number of retracted articles, of corrected articles, and the number of fake articles, which are based on data and results that are fake. And worst of all, this results in non-replicable science, in science we cannot rely on. And this is problematic not only because it runs against the value of science, the continuous pursuit of truth, but also because it can be dangerous for the, uh, for the population. If political decisions are based on non-replicable findings, on findings we cannot rely on, this can cause real, real problems. Nevertheless, we as scientists are pretty happy in our jobs. And we're happy not because of the conditions, but despite the conditions. And we are happy because we are free. We are free to research things that we love. And we love science, we don't love academia. And so we are pretty much privileged. But I think what most scientists don't realize is that with this privilege also comes a responsibility. We are responsible because science is part of society. Because science is funded by society, so the money we get comes from tax money, either directly through funding the universities or indirectly through um, the, the, um, the funding institutions like the Fonds National de la Recherche here in Luxembourg. So we get the money from them, and I think it would be our responsibility to give them something back to communicate about our findings, to communicate about what all of this means, and to produce things that are for the benefit of society. So this goes back to the, to the trust question. But this is exactly what is not rewarded in the science system. When we come back to the Abel Bremen and Bühner study, what we see there is that communication or efforts for making good science are among the least valued criteria. And this is shocking. So I think the consequence should not be that we find more system players within academia, but that we find people who are willing to assume this responsibility for science, who are able to bridge the gap between science and society, who want to produce reliable research, and who want to prove themselves trustworthy. And also, I also am perceiving a paradigm shift in a way. So if you look at the social media, there's many young scientists who are fed up with this lack of overlap between science and academia, who are fed up with the non-replicable findings, who want to do good science and who want to communicate about this in order to align science and academia again. And I think science has a lot to give to society. Not only that we produce nice results like the, like the smartphone or medicine or whatever, but I think what science can give especially is our way to approach complexity, our way to approach uncertainty, because this is what the scientific method is about, that scientists correct each other without having to be afraid that somebody uses this to their advantage. This is the ideal science, this is not academia. What we can also learn from science is to value evidence over opinion. Science has a lot to give here that we try to 
describe the reality as objectively as possible, if we try to explain it, but we try to make predictions, but not based on our opinion, but on solid facts. What science also has to offer that we work with each other and not against each other. And mistakes are not so problematic if we can rely on the others that help us finding these mistakes which we make and help us correct them and to continuously understand the world. Can science be a role model? I think it can if people perceive science to be trustworthy. And one important prerequisite is for this is that science has to adhere to its core value, the pursuit of truth. And I think this is so much more than any propaganda can give us. The Swiss developmental psychologist Jean Piaget once said that every child is a scientist. And I think this is true not only for children, but also for adults. But being a scientist maybe also means that you hide in your little ivory tower from time to time. And this is maybe truth for every one of us too. We sit in our own ivory tower somewhere apart from the world, which may be nice from time to time because you need some little time alone. But this very ivory tower may become a prison once it splits you off the world. And so my appeal to you is, let's tear down these walls. Let's embrace the freedom we are given. And above all, let's stay curious about this world we're living in together. Thanks very much.